welcome here again to our Friday features. This is our uh, monthly uh, sit down with uh, our, our doctors and experts uh, in different fields, and this being the 50th anniversary of Humane Vitae, the, the month of July here, and in particular, the July 25th just passed. And uh, we're really excited to have you here, doctor, to kind of talk to us a little bit about Humana Vitae, what the document has kind of meant to you personally, but also how you've kind of seen it interact in the, in the practice, day in and day out, um, uh, you know, whether it be the, 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 how patients have interacted with it, how you've kind of, it's been maybe a, a backbone for you and, mm -hmm. and how you practice medicine and the other docs here at Tepiac, but also, um, we were really kind of looking at what reflected to me, and I, I, as I was kind of reviewing, I, I look at the prophecies, and I think this is amazing stuff. And it wasn't just, it, to me, it, it's not always what, what Paul VI had in mind and what he was, was trying to convey in this document, but even people well before him that were secular individuals mm -hmm. that really felt the same way, that like, you know, when you start to integrate uh, contraception within a, a marital relationship, and within society in general, the, the, the really the shortcomings of what, oh, yeah. what is taking When you place. separate love and life, um, some really rough things come out of it. Yeah. Um, and so, no, I've, like I said, uh, and I, I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you all and to have this conversation because I'm not always, I wasn't always a follower of this. <laughs> you know, I grew up um, in a family that believed it, but because of my education and because of I wanted to do what was right by the women that I knew, my friends. Remember, I've learned about this through my friends who are females. I wanted to liberate them from the chains of their fertility back in the 60s and well, 70s and 80s and early, and so in the early 90s. So I wasn't, I thought Humane Vitae was a joke. I actually thought it was an embarrassment. I thought, you know, my God, they had to have gotten this wrong. And over time, it was you women telling me uh, there's something wrong here. So that's the first thing I want to tell people that this is, I wasn't always born into this and said, oh yes, I believe it because they said it. I didn't believe it and now I believe it because my experience as a doctor and as a friend of a lot of my patients as a gynecologist, they're the, you're the ones teaching me now. And so once again, um, I find it to be uh, quite prophetic quite helpful. And you know, I was going to start, um, isn't this classic? Uh, here we are on the 50th anniversary of Humane Vitae. And the cover of, of ESPN magazine, this is the July 30th issue, has a wonderful gymnast on the cover by the name of Allie Reisman. She's five feet tall. She recently testified against the gentleman uh, who was in charge of the United States program. Mm -hmm. Uh, of abusing her. And the title says, we have to change the way our society views women. Front cover, ESPN magazine, right? You can be watching TV, right? And we hashtag me too, Harvey Weinstein, right? Um, if you've been around some Catholic circles, we have an issue with uh, a past uh, Cardinal McCarrick. These are issues where um, when you begin to separate love and life, all of a sudden, things begin to go really awry. And um, through my education in medicine, it was always more contraception. <laughs> it's never less. Oh, no, we, if you have diabetes, we'll just change the dose. Oh, if you, we'll just find new ways to contracept you, kind of, that it's a good, healthy thing. And in fact... Everywhere, every time, in every condition, if you have no periods, if you have heavy periods, if you only want one child, if you don't want any children, if you need abortion as a backup, all these things grew out of this belief that contraception is good for you and for me. And um, if that were the case, we would see a drop in antidepressant medicines. Mm. We would see a drop in divorces we would see a drop in suicide. healthy relationships or suicides or depression yeah. or medical problems. It's the opposite of that. It's just it? the opposite because it's very hard to stay on the medicine because of all the side effects, mm. the headaches and the bloatedness. On 
studies that are well controlled, forget about the woman in, the, in her home who's having breakthrough bleeding or has put on a few pounds. And so I think what you were driving at is, you know, that this document that came out in July of 1968, now remember the whole world was against it, including many <coughs> within the church. <laughs> mm. Many within the church says, ah, no, it's not, we can kind of dissent from this because this is just, this is not right. Um, well, as you were alluding to, inside that document, he predicted that if you separate this important area that God put together back mm -hmm. in Genesis, love and life, you're going to start having serious problems, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and the other thing that I find amazing, too, in your own journey, but it, it, I think it's very similar, uh, and you touched upon it a moment ago, is that a lot of people just didn't buy into it. They didn't, they, 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 they thought it was a silly document. And even to this day, there's a large portion, some say yes. over 90% of your, yes. of your Catholics who are not contraceptive. <laughs> So, who, who actually, I should say, who are contracepting. Correct. And, 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 no, yeah. when I came to this area from uh, Silver Spring, Maryland in 1993, I interviewed the chairman of our department right across the hallway from our office here at 4001 Fairridge Drive. He basically looked at me and said, you don't provide contraception? Why don't you come work with me in about 12 months when the practice folds? Because that was the bread and butter. Everyone was, was doing it, that. It was the bread and butter, but it was already a given in 1993. Because, you know, remember, we had to have the Casey decision that abortion was the backup. The reason why we have abortion is because it failed contraception. 50% yeah. of all abortions are because of failed contraception, mm. not no contraception. Right. And so, once again, as the practices across the country began to spring up in the mid, those early 90s, mm -hmm. and now, you know, there's now practices all over the country that we're trying to, you know, encourage. Mm -hmm. Because I think women are beginning, after 50 years, they've learned that, wait a second, there's got to be a better way. Now, contraception, you know, once again, these medicines are medicines. They're, they're amoral. They work and they care. Some of these medical conditions you can treat. But the vast, there's a lot of better ways to do this. I just think that this, um, most folks haven't never read the document because they think it's too religious. But in section, I think 17 or 18, he talks about what would happen. Infidelity and moral decline, lost respect for women, the abuse of power that governments would then say to unsuspecting people, we should just be able to contracept you, to control you. And also this unlimited dominion. Just think about this. Once you separate love and life, you then have to have abortion as a backup for the failure because the mentality is very similar. I don't want a child right now. And I need to do whatever I can to not do that. Then you have the in vitro fertilization piece where you can have babies without sex. And you can treat them as property, not as children do you love them or do you own them think about all of us out there who's gone through ivf or who have done ivf do you own them or do you love them are they your property or are they your children and now think about all the genetic issues with crispr and genetic diagnoses where if if your child is not perfect you can end it so there's no such thing as a perinatal hospice and all of a sudden, we're caught up in this morass in gynecology where we are suppressing a woman's fertility. It's a disease. Children are the sexually transmitted disease of fertility. And we can do whatever the heck we want to you and your body and your hormones. And if there is a mistake and something does pass through, then being good health care, we need to provide an abortion mm. for you. It's funny, good and, health care, I think... It, you raise a point. Good health care, you know, the chemical contraception is one that, that is the antithesis of, of health care in general. Health care in general is meant to improve the body in some way right. through medicine or through, through medical practice, excellent medicine. But the contracept, chemical contraception is actually meant to, do, is to have the body do something opposite of what it's naturally supposed to do. Correct. I, you know, 
there are so many really good, smart people out there. I just see the challenges here in the office with my patients. And, you know, we have to have, we have to change the way our society views women. Once again, they're a body, soul, and spirit put together. They deserve so much better. They deserve to be cooperated and listened to. Um, this young woman, it's, what's interesting is that all of us in the Christian world, and I'll say that um, because that's my experience, we understand that marriage um, is something elevated, right? Uh, we talk about in the beginning it was not so when they questioned Christ about divorce. But also in the beginning, two become one flesh. In the beginning, there's something deeper. So when some of the church's teaching on the theology of the body pick up on that, we're trying to get back to in the beginning. And it's very hard to put the genie in the bottle or, right. the, or the spirit out of the, the box that's been opened. Yeah. And we bear that brunt. I bought into it, and many of my patients did. Because mm -hmm. once again, here, this is, and, um, uh, this, is, this is a big deal. We understand that marriage is something more. You know, men are supposed to love their wives as God loves the church, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is in Ephesians 5. And, and, then, and that's a real issue no, because yeah, yeah, this is what these women are talking about. Right. And I think we have a society, and I think what, this, what over the past 50 years has kind of brought out is that what is our version of love? What does will love mean? Well, for some people, it's sexual relations. But for those who have a deeper understanding and meaning of love, it's sacrifice for that other person. And, and it's through alternative means of, of planning your family where the, where the male can decide, okay, I'm going to master the will. I'm going to sacrifice on behalf of my wife because she's, she's stressed or she's not feeling well or we've just had our fourth child and, and life is a little hectic. I, mean, I think that's yeah, the, I agree. the part here that I think... Well, and see, and, and that's the beauty of this is that in the 1970s, no one believed this document, right? It was outdated, it was outmoded, and yet that, this particular document, document written you know, with all the blessing of an old Italian man, mm -hmm. predicted what would happen 50 years later if we followed this path. And they were the ones spot on. My profession said, oh no, more happiness, more health, yeah. more children, better marriages, healthier children. Yeah. Wait a second. Complete opposite. Yeah. The complete opposite. But in that same document, <clears throat> it talks about self-mastery in section 21 as the blessing the gift, so to speak, as you talk about, what's real freedom? Freedom is when you know the rules. As my son, my son was at home and he's uh, playing the guitar. He can play Stevie Van Zandt and he can play Eric Clapton and he can play James Taylor because he knows the rules and he knows how the music's put together. So he's free to be a great musician because he knows the foundations. Mm -hmm. That same document, three paragraphs after he predicts the negative, says self-mastery is the key. Because only when you have self-mastery, me, I'm talking to myself here, are you truly free to choose the good or the better or the love. Only when you have self-mastery do I continue to love my wife of 28 years. Why? Because that's where real power comes from. So when he talks in 2 Timothy 1, 7, that the Holy Spirit didn't come to give you timidity. It came to give you power and love and self-discipline. They talk about that. This young lady, who I really admire, these are the heroes, the hero issue. She's an athlete. She knows what sacrifice is, right, Will? Mm -hmm. You know, I played ball, you crewed. There are times you've got to push yourself away from that dinner table to get your weight and your acumen, and you have to discipline yourself. Mm -hmm. My son's wrestled. Many of you women out there have given up lots of things so your family and you can flourish. Self-mastery. And that's the key. That's John 15. You're part of a vine, and he wants to prune you so you bear more fruit mm. so that you're free to follow him. And in healthcare, if you've never, ever thought about this before, start thinking about it. 
it's a whole new way of looking at your health and your body and your fertility and your hormones and your relationships with your partner, with your spouse, with your children, with your future children, with your church. And once again, this was not meant for Catholics. <laughs> this, is, this is like, this is what the human was created for, to know, love, and serve God in this world and be with him forever in the next. I mean, that's not a punchline. That's biblical, scriptural. They talk about, you know, quivers being filled with children. Well, you don't, some people can't have that. Mm. But you still can have that when you don't separate love and life, which God did together. And yet we try to think about that. And so, yeah, this is a big yeah. deal, a big, big anniversary. So tell, tell from a day-to-day -day standpoint, from on the ground and, and caring for women here at Tepeyac, Tell me a little bit how you've kind of witnessed with it's it's without obviously sharing those individuals' names, but maybe parts of their stories that that how they felt whether it be degraded over the years or or their marriages have suffered because of of contraception or, or not being in line with Amani Vita. You know, I, there's there, there's stories there's stories all the time, and um, it you know it comes up in. Listen, for one example, um, trying to teach young medical students and young nursing students to listen to their patients. In order to have health, you have to have a relationship. So for all of you folks out there, there is a higher power and you're not it. You know, for people who don't have a faith or a you know, belief in Christ, mm -hmm. there is a higher power. It's one of those basis of one of those 12-step programs. For us, we believe that we have a father. And in order to have health, you have to have relationships. You and your family, you and your friends, you and the provider, as well as you and your creator. That's all part of health is based on relationships. So to take time to listen to your story is part of the way of Humanae Vitae. How can I know if I'm, there was a recent article, a doctor stops listening after 15 yes, seconds. I saw that, yeah. 15 seconds. Well, we're trying to 15 minutes per patient at the simplest end here at Tepeyac. Why? Because we want to try to get to know you. We want to try to listen to your story, to get to know the whole person. So that's one of the things. The other things were people who would come to me and go, I stopped, I stopped that pill. I was having headaches. I was putting on weight. And then you suggested that I inject something in my arm that stays there for three months. I didn't want to do it on a daily basis. Why would I do that now? Or the cramping, or the side effects, or the whole idea of why is my husband getting off scot-free if all those chemicals are being pushed into my body? So many folks out there, this is not a religious issue. This is a medical issue. The side effects I see as patients coming in they want a different way. I really don't want to go back on birth control for polycystic ovaries. I really don't want to be put on birth control for PMS. I don't really want to have hormones for that change of lifetime. These are all practical examples. And then on top of it, the young ladies who come in here at the tender age of 54 with no children, There's many of you all out there. You've, you don't have, your first marriage failed. You're now maybe on your second marriage or you're dating and you're in your 50s and you have no children. And there's a little bit of a cynicism there saying, I bought a bill of goods that didn't deliver. Eventually I would find a good marriage with contraception. Eventually. I could have multiple partners and not be hurt physically or spiritually or emotionally. Mm. And now my FSH is low, or my FSH is high, my AMH is low, and I'm infertile. I'm, I'm past that time. When you realize, and I'm seeing more and more articles in the Atlantic Monthly, the New Yorker, New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, you end up at the end of your life and you realized you bought a bill of goods that didn't deliver on happiness or health or wholeness. That's it. And I'm telling you, that's a real hard place to be.
And that, those, that's the impression. It's not, and then I've had a lot of young women who come in here who have really cooperated with their body and they know their cycle and they know that their, their progesterone may be off because they're feeling such and such a way. You know, knowledge is power, right? And I think it's, but it, once again, this goes against almost the foundational principle of the last 50 years. What do you mean you're against contraception? I'm not really against it. It's just it hasn't worked out, right? <laughs> and so, you know, it's a real challenge. I think there are many ways naturally to, you know, if you really believe that you need one, two, three kids, if that's what the Lord's, mm -hmm. if that's what you think, well, there are better ways to do it than just <clears throat> dumping those chemicals into your body or injecting those things under your arm or putting those things in your uterus. Right. So, uh, but that in a nutshell, those are the patients. Yeah. How um, have you also experienced, I mean, we, we look up at the, the other prediction here of, uh, of the abuse of power in the state, and I think mm -hmm. it's amazing that that prophecy within that document and how it's even affected the medical world. I mean, I, I think, I, I, from my readings and my research, I, I get concerned that, that doctors are going to be forced to have to implement you know, chemical mm -hmm. contraception or be forced to do things that are outside their faith. Well, you know, yes, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, a, a current example is that the city of Baltimore was doing implantable contraceptives in a lot of young teens in certain school districts mm -hmm. because their, they, their unwanted pregnancy rate was so high that they were forced to force the children into taking long, you know, long-acting reversible contraceptives. Mm -hmm. Like as not asking but telling them that's what's needed. Yeah. So once again, historically, the state of Virginia used to sterilize feeble-minded people yeah. into the 1960s and 70s. Yeah. Well, where, where do you think the, you know, the, the folks, the, 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 the Nazis in Germany yeah. figured? They came here to yeah. learn from us. Yeah. And so what happens is it's not that far of a stretch to think of what's happening in China. They're being held up as this new up-and-coming power and... Oh, by the way, they forcibly used a one-child policy to do that because the world has decided that it's better to kill your future mm -hmm. than to teach your people how to work Man with it, yeah. manage it. Mm. And so therefore, anytime you go give talks to most people and they talk about poverty, how do you get people out of poverty? Less children. How do you get less children? Contracept. Wait a second. What? Because once again, we have an aversion to talking to people about behavior. Mm. How many young girls out there who are in their 16, 17, 18, 19, 20s, let alone adults, don't enjoy sex with their boyfriends? Because they're being used. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not rocket science. You've got to engage. You've got to come to a relationship with somebody enough to tell them, to talk to them about this, mm -hmm. honestly. We're not proselytizing. You're not even trying. But just have people aware of this. And I think more and more women are waking up going, you know, there's got to be another way than this. Um, but I've talked about the city of Baltimore, obviously, you know, the problem here in this state. Uh, but yes, uh, I think a lot of times um, you will see, um, you know, uh, you will see governments, because they're trying to save money, revert or resort to draconian means. And this may be one of those. Yeah. You know, you talk, we talked about the prophecies of this, both the negative and the positive, and, you know, I think you dabbled a little bit early in your comments about some other ripple effects of, of this document, or at least the, some additional problems that maybe weren't put in this document, but, but, but you've seen arise. Mm. I mean, we look at the, you know, you can go down the line of, if, 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 if if gender, you know, the gender complexity that, that's going on, the dysphoria there, that, that if, if you're, um, you just look at what your tools are to, to, to procreate and what does that mean? And when that barrier is brought up in between the, in the marriage, between the act and, 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 preg and, and the purpose of the act, which would be unifi unification and procreation, when, the, when there's that barrier that's brought up, there's now, an, it seems like it's a slippery slope of continual things that can be spun from that. I think it's like our children, or myself for that matter, 
start off with a little lie and you end up with bigger lies. So it's not that bad to, well, come on, Johnny, in the 1930s, you know, we probably need contraception to save some marriages, you know, the children pressure. So let's just utilize it for good marriages, but only in marriage. And that was in the 1930s. And by the now year 2030, uh, we're making babies in test tubes. Uh, we're, uh, then we can eliminate diseases because we just kind of get rid of the, the children that are sick. And the parents, is our, the parents are the ones that are going to help, you know, identify that with right. the doctor. And so I, I, think it, I think there is a lot of danger here because I think we're living right now there. Um, you start off with living a lie. And our body is an expression of who we are because we're a body, soul, and spirit. And when you start doing things that disrupt the purposes ingrained in us from the beginning, you tell a lie with your body. And then the next thing you do is you tell the lie to your wife. Then you tell the lie to your children. Then you teach the lie in school. And then you propagate the lie in medicine. And then the churchmen and the church women become confused. And they just think that we need to kind of get away from this to make it more easy. The secret for us Christians, the blessing, because this, this document is nothing but mercy. <laughs> the Lord tried to warn us. <laughs> what would happen? And it's coming true. I'm convinced that once you begin to tell the lie with your body, everything becomes open-ended. Mm. So for myself, yes, I can abort a fetus that's a half inch big. And I found myself aborting a two-pound infant. Aborting a two-pound infant. Mm. And I think it's the same with all of this because of the battle inside the heart, the human heart. Mm. I want mercy, not sacrifice. <clears throat> he wants us... He, we, we should grapple with this because... The real, the secret to health is I want you to have abundant life. Mm -hmm. and ha I want you to have life and have it abundantly. Well, how do you do that? Uh, you pick up your cross every day and follow me. You drop what you're doing and make me the center, Jesus Christ. That's the key. It's self-mastery. Because every time I choose more food, more sex, more alcohol, more freneticness, mm -hmm. I have less peace, less joy, less health. And think about it in our marriages. Think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm thinking about it for myself. You know? Um, and we have an opportunity right now because the whole world is talking about these young women the whole world is talking about the abuse in Hollywood. The whole world is talking about the abuse within the church. We have an opportunity here, folks, to participate in a renewal or a resurgence or a revival or a renaissance by allowing Christ and the simple teaching of Scripture and tradition you know, you have all these different churches out there that kind of went their separate way. Oh, this was just for the Catholics. Oh, they're mm -hmm. probably wrong. Oh, we have to be good stewards with our bodies. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you mean good stewards? Then does that mean that your 14-year-old, the only thing you can tell that 14-year-old is to use contraception when you're sleeping with the boyfriend who's going to use you and leave you? No. You're, yeah, you're missing the other aspects You've of the emotional the whole connection. And... Yes. Or real freedom is about self-mastery. Yeah. Like my son playing his guitar. Or, you know, you know, the, 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 or real love the person, is sacrifice, right? It, it, greater know, love is no man than he who gives his life for another. Right. So, so at, at Tepiak, we, the, the rough. And this resonates with people who are Christian and who are not Christian, because these principles. Well, to my point, yes. this is where I was going, is, is we've got a dynamic at Tepiak that's maybe roughly somewhere between 45 and 50 percent of the patients are Catholic, maybe another 30 to 35 percent are another denomination of Christian. And then you have 15 25, or so, 15, 20 25 percent, yeah, who are either agnostic or Muslim or another yeah, faith. Right. Um, 
how does this sort of methodology that how, how does it resonate with them? Where what are the what are the, the selling points of, for lack of a well, better? Well, once term? again, once again, I think if you for, if you want to form a relationship to figure out where people are coming from, <clears throat> number one, mm -hmm. number two is we believe in truth. So, like when you come here, we try to tell you ahead of time these are things we can do, these are the things we really encourage you, and these are the things we probably can't do. Yeah. So we're truthful in every aspect. So the first thing is listening. That's what, that's what these documents are all about. Listening to the language of your body that was given to you by your creator. This isn't chance. <laughs> this is the way you're made. Mm -hmm. And you, whether you like it or not, you kind of know it. Yeah. Any man who's masturbated, any woman who's had affairs, and these are things that kind of get at you. You feel bad. Mm -hmm. Oh, the first time it might be really exciting, the second time, eh, the third time, what the heck am I doing? Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're in a, you know, an illicit relationship when you're 12, 13, or 57. Yeah. And so this is how it is. So first off, listen to the patient. Secondly, be truthful with this method. Tell them ahead of time, but also tell them these are the options that we use. You know, this is natural fertility awareness. These are all the methods that can be utilized. This is how you listen to the language of your body. This is how we get to the root of the problem. How many of you out there want to get to the root of your problem? And you don't want another Band-Aid approach, another chemical thrown at you, right? Why do you go to homeopaths? Why do you go to chiropractors? Why do you go? Because medicine has lost its soul period. Once you try to separate the creator from the created, <laughs> it just kind of gets kind of crazy out there. And I'm not going to listen to you. I have two and a half minutes. I'm done. I'm sorry. Listen, be truthful. If I disagree with you, it's not because I don't like you. It's because I disagree and you disagree. Let's talk about it. You think about what I said. And I think about what you said. And guess what? Things work out well because we're both into it for health reasons. And you kind of know what to expect from us. There's no judgment here, because <laughs> we've all done it. There's no judgment. Yeah. And so listening, the truth, and then looking at your hormones, looking at your blood work or your saliva. The indicators. The yeah. indicators. Yeah. And then try to formulate a plan of action for a condition. And that condition doesn't have to be disease, Will. Mm. It might be that you've just been beat down by life and stress is getting to you. Mm. So once again, I think the folks here, we're not into disease, we're into health. That's why we focus on the, the good of fertility and that children are not STDs, that you just get rid of them like you get rid of gonorrhea and syphilis. And so it's that kind of holistic approach. And when we fail, our patients talk, tell us about it. Meaning, and so it's on every level, there's a certain truth to it. Because I think this document is about the truth of how the language of our bodies speak to us. And so many of us out there want health. We want to be free of the chemicals so we can breathe again and let our bodies do what they were designed to do or created to do. And that comes across whether you're a crystal worshiper or whether you know Buddha or whether you know Jesus Christ or whether you know Muhammad. Once again, I think that those principles resonate across the board. Yeah. Well, it kind of goes back to what it's, it's meeting people where they're at, understanding them mm. and their stories, listening to them and building that relationship, which builds trust in the end. And I think that's... Mm. It's very fundamental. It's, it's, it's what we should be doing in a lot of our relationships. And yet, it's, and yet it's hard to build trust because you trust people and they lead you astray. Now, I'm not pointing, this is just in the news, but I'm guilty. I used to do this. Not abuse, but I used to believe that this was a healthy way to do things. Right, that you were helping women in this way. Yes. And you helped me see this as, hey, uh, not so fast. Because it's me. I'm the one, you know, as I had, we all have to pull the plank out of our own eye. How can we do this better? But experience sociologically, politically, physically, spiritually has shown me that this document is spot on. It's not an embarrassment. It's the keystone yeah. to renewal. 
Speaking of that, wh where do we go from here? I mean, it, it's it's you know, it's a great time, fifty years, to kind of look back and say, "Whoa, look 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 what it's happened. Look what these these look at the prophecy kind of did predict." But how do, you know? And you've got articles like this. You got the Harvey Weinstein's. You got the, the Me Too movement. And and it, what can be done? Uh, once again, I, as we talk about transforming hearts through health care, it's a matter of the heart. And we have to be patient and wait for you. All of you folks out there on the fence who, you know, you're still trying to find which way is the right way. And, you know, it's very hard to go out and talk about this because um, for someone who did it for a few years of my practice, uh, no, you're not going to criticize me like that. Mm. But when the doubt creeps in, we can be there ready to provide excellent health care, but also a good ear to listen to your story, to maybe try to put those pieces back together. Uh, for us here, it involves all about you, the patient. Um, we're here to serve you at Tepeyac OBGYN. End of discussion. And we wanna do that better each and every day. For the system of Divine Mercy Care, we're trying to work through Pro Women's Healthcare Centers to support standards across the country where abortion is not good health care. <clears throat> Pumping hormones into your body is not the best way to space children. <laughs> that there's other ways to do this and that we can do this cooperatively and collaboratively and we can help one another across the country. Um, I think them, it's... Uh, pull the, put yes. the links together. Like yes. you have correlation that yes this was predicted yes. 50 years ago yes. but look at how it's manifesting itself in the variety of ways right. in today's society this and article. also and also on the you know on kind of a, on the, the body of christ way also trying to talk to our brothers and sisters who may not see this as a core truth and really have a j straightforward conversation about it because we're here and you're there to instruct the ignorant counsel the doubtful uh, you know lift up the downtrodden care for the sick. Well, I want people to do that with us. Meaning, you know, if for folks who think that we may be in error, to let us know. Mm -hmm. But also for us to just be witnesses and to be really good collaborators and um, cooperators in your health care. To say, hey man, maybe, you, maybe we need to look at this approach to your fertility or to your PMS or to your endometriosis. Um, but this is not about politics or religion. It's about the human person, about the woman. And uh, this language of the body, this genius of the feminine, is part of the equality of the sexes as well as it's part of the, uh, um, the, um, the, the, the collaboration and the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the uh, complementariness of the sexes. And I learn every day from my female patients, you know, how to speak this, you know, better or more clearly, yeah. not to be judgmental, things like that. Yeah. I, I wonder, how often do you counsel or you have the opportunity to both counsel the husband and hmm. the wife or the patient? Is that... <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll give you one story. N not as often as I think we'd like. A young lady comes to us from Quantico, Virginia, She's married to a Marine colonel. And uh, at the end of the visit, she's 51. He's probably 52. At the end of the visit, she says, you know, Dr. Brachowski, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little tired of having relations. I said, you know, it's very common at your age, ma'am, at 50. You know, things change. Uh, I know you, we're, we're, we're almost finished with your visit, but do you have a minute to talk? Yeah, I have a minute. She says... Um, my husband uh, and I have sex, you know, 34 times a month. And I said, a month? She goes, yeah, just about every day. He's a busy working man and he needs, he doesn't want to hurt. 34 times a month. And I laughed, she laughed. And I said, well, that, that can make it a little tiring. Um, maybe I can talk to him about it because, you know, as you age, you're lining. And so we talked, so he came in. So here I am in a room with a six foot four killing machine, a, a Marine Corps colonel who's in charge of a lot of men. And he talked about the, the difficulty of 
you know, being a virile man and how he needed, you know, to release. And this, this is not a religious couple. This is just a physical couple. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I said, there may be a better way here. If you kind of listen to your woman's, listen to your wife's language of her body, that it gets a little tiring. So we talked about like the hormones, but we all talked about kind of a little self mastery. Like, what do you do on the field, Colonel? Yeah. Do you, well, no, I'm continent when I'm in battle. Of course you are. Think about that in your marriage. I get a note on Quantico stationery, dear Dr. Wachowski, my sex life has improved since we took the advice. <laughs> so I only say that because you don't know what you, you hear. I mean, this is a fascinating business we're in. Too much sex, too little sex, you know, kind of sex with other people. We hear it all. And there's no blame, there's no, but there's a lot of practical common sense that needs to be shared. And there's a lot of times when if, my, if the woman, you know, can't really tell the husband a certain thing, maybe the docs here, both the male and the female docs can talk to their husbands. We talk about an OBGYN ultimately cares for two patients, the woman, and if the woman is pregnant, both the woman and the child. But in most relationships, there's a woman and her partner, most of the time a man. And um, there's a certain almost aspect that I'm beginning to realize after 30 something years of doing this, mm -hmm. that maybe we really take care of three people. And just because two become one flesh when people start having sex, mm -hmm. that that reality is just as important as the reality of a fetus, a baby growing inside a woman. Mm -hmm. And that I think we probably need to be more aware of that and to help that conversation develop in that area. Once again, life is full of challenges and it's not perfect. But this whole idea of bringing the man into the equation I think is a very good one. Yeah. And it reminds me that I probably should do that more often. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much for oh. your time today and uh, thank you all for, for tuning in. Really please like and share this. And really do a deeper dive yourselves and into this document, into uh, the other, uh, as this being the 50th year, it is going to be, there's a lot of resources out there for you to kind of take that deeper dive and, and explore it some more. But uh, above all, thank you, oh, no. Doc. Oh, I appreciate please, it. Really, you're and, welcome. Uh, and God bless you all. And uh, keep us in your prayers as we pray for you.